started then. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome back to Learn Now by SpringPod, where you'll discover fantastic career stories that inspire you to take control of your future and give you insights into different career pathways. Now, if you're new here, uh, we are SpringPod, an early careers network for young people who are keen to explore their next opportunities from university to apprenticeships and more. And for anyone who is possibly interested in watching some of those sessions that we've done so far, there are over 40 of them available, absolutely free and all on demand, available on our website at learn.springpod.co.uk. So we do recommend that you take a look at some of those because we've had some fantastic sessions, really, really inspiring talks as well, from international explorers to news presenters to Emmy-winning sound editors, and even ones from organizations like MS, Cap Gemini, and many others, big, big names. Uh, my name is Joe, and I'll be hosting this afternoon's session of Learn Lounge. Just a couple of pointers before we start. The talk should last about 45 minutes. Please do ask questions, like I mentioned to our guest Lee today. He's absolutely love to answer them. And don't forget to tag us on social media with the hashtag, hashtag Learn Lounge. And finally, we'll be raising money for the Children's Trust. So please do donate. Now, today we'll be chatting with Lee Wilcox, CEO and uh, co-founder of Electric House, one of the fastest growing social media and publishing groups in the UK. Uh, Lee's a multi-award winning entrepreneur and was recognised uh, as the Creative Industries and Overall Midlands Entrepreneur of the Year at the NatWest Great British Entrepreneur Awards. That's quite the award to have. Lee's incredible story, uh, which he'll share with us today, is a brilliant example of the possibilities that you can open yourselves up to if you just decide to follow your passion. Now, we're really, really excited to have him here with us today. Welcome to Learn Lounge, Lee. Thank you for being here. No problem. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. Um, I understand you've got a uh, presentation for us and you're going to be sharing your screen uh, for that. Um, so if you want to get that set up and uh, we'll, we'll that now. see that for today. Like I said, to anyone who's watching, if you've got questions for Lee, then please do use the Q&A function and we'll answer as many of them as we possibly can. Right, Lee Wilcox, co-founder of CEO of Electric House, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, so you should all be able to see that. Um, opening screen there with uh, with my thinner and less bearded face uh, and better <laughs> haircut than I've got now through lockdown, unfortunately. Um, so today I wanted to sort of, I guess, just tell you the story of how um, I ended up being the co-founder and CEO um, of a business, just in uh, any business really, um, because I guess when I was younger, uh, that was definitely not what was sort of on the cards um, or, or planned. So rather than talk about ele what Electric House does um, right now, which I'll sort of come on to towards the end, um, what I wanted to do is sort of um, thank you through, uh, I won't take you through my childhood, we won't start from two years old, but um, there's a, uh, there we go. The uh, the younger version of me. So when when I was this is myself and Adam. So Adam is the the other co-founder of Electric House, and um, uh, we've known each other since we were kids. And back then, you know, at this point here, I am uh, fourteen years old, so I'm approaching uh, exam time, I guess, in in terms of GCSEs. Uh, I'm getting to a point where my parents are asking me what I actually want to do with my life. Um, and I have no clue. Um, you know, from my perspective at that age, all I wanted to do was be with my mates. Um, and all I wanted to do really was just play football. Um, I was really, really into sports. You know, me and Adam uh, played golf a bit. There's, I mean, look at that hairdo. You, you learn some things that you when you look back. I was going through these photos uh, in the week, um, harrowing some of them. But that's my dad there. Um, so I was at a stage really where I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. And, and I think there was probably more pressures than I would have liked to sort of try and get to that point. Um, and I think as you go through that period of time where you're trying to, you know, maybe you're making decisions on picking which subjects you need to take or you're then take, making decisions on whether you want to stay on at sixth form or go to an academy or go to a college or do, do an apprenticeship or get a job, you know, and I didn't know what I wanted to do in any of these things. I had, I, there was just not a clue in, um, at all. Um, so it came to uh, the end of school. Um, 
and I've got a little anagram here for you. Um, and uh, these are actually just poor grades. They were the grades I got at school. And um, when you, uh, if you just look at those there, the top line was my uh, GCSE, which, you know, actually I was quite pleased with. I got an A in drama and I got a B in maths and then C's in English and struggled with science and business studies, ironically, uh, I got an E in. Um, and then I stayed on at sixth form, not really because that was the path I wanted to take or because that was what I thought would get me uh, the career that I wanted. It was just because uh, I didn't know what else to do. And then I ended up getting two E's and a U, um, which at the time I was, I was, I was shocked at. And actually I look back now and think, Wait, why were you shocked? Because you didn't really do much. Um, I wasn't the most academic. Uh, I think I've got by uh, most of my life from just um, trying to be nice to people and uh, potentially trying to crack the odd joke. Um, and at that that stage there, I was still hoping to go to university. They, they were the grades that I then was, on, on the day of getting my results, I was on the phone to universities, basically begging to, to let them, to, to, to let me in. Uh, my first choice was Bolton and, and they wouldn't let me go there because my grades weren't good enough. Uh, and I rang around a few others. Um, I can't remember what they call it now. There's a, there's a name for it where you sort of go into this pot where you've got to wait um, and see if you can get a, a university that will take you. Um, and um, I got took by Derby University, which was not too far away. I'm, I'm based in Tamworth, uh, which is sort of by Birmingham. So it wasn't too far but I wanted to stay there and that was basically why I chose to go to university. Again, it was nothing to do with my job or a career. It was to do with the fact that I um, I just wanted to carry on in education and, and not get a job, I guess, because I just didn't know what I wanted to do. The thought of getting a job at that point really sort of frightened me and, uh, you know, I de definitely something that I didn't want to do. Um, I'd had part-time jobs, you know, bars and things like that. But um, So then I found myself at the University of Derby and, I uh, did the first year, um, loved that, loved the lifestyle, loved um, loved everything about it, except for the lectures. Um, that was a bit that I didn't really like. And, and probably over time, then I, I got towards the end of the first year and I stopped going to less of the lectures. And then we moved out of halls and I moved in with some friends and it was amazing. And we had this, you know, I was free to do whatever I wanted. And, um, you know, I was living the life. And then I started getting letters off university basically saying you're not coming to university much we're probably going to kick you out um and i got one of those letters and then a couple of weeks later i got another and i thought oh you know generally i'm not like a naughty person i wasn't like a naughty kid at school or uh and i just thought oh this is horrible you know my mom and dad has fought some money to me for me to be here um I, I need to not, I need to quit. I need to not be here. Uh, I need to not, I'm going to end up, if I either, I'll end up getting chucked out, which is way worse, um, or I could get to the end of this three years and then not actually get a degree. And then, you know, that would be a travesty. Um, so I quit. I packed my bags that night that I got that second letter. Um, and I moved back in with my mom and dad. Um, and I was devastated because the reality had kicked in then. And the one thing, my, I turned up to my mum and dad's with my, with my bag of stuff and my mum opened the door, shocked to see me. And I said, uh, I, I need to stay here. I've quit university. And, and she didn't even ask why. She just said, okay, you can stay here, but you need to get a job tomorrow morning. Um, it makes my mum sound really harsh. She's not, um, uh, and she wasn't. But it was the reality of, of moving home and, and sort of, I, I guess, stepping into what felt like stepping into adulthood. Um, so the next morning I was out with a, with a, a budged CV trying to get work. Um, and I ended up getting a job at a local um, forecourt, the garage there. Um, and then a week later, I got another job, um, which was working in the sort of retail side of uh, like a service station. And then I got a third job. Um, which was working at the Belfry, which is a golf course in, in Tamworth. I was working on the bars there. So I had three like part-time jobs that I was basically making a full-time job. Um, but the reality again was, and th this pattern unfortunately didn't change, was that I still didn't know what I wanted to do. 
all I knew I needed to do was I needed to get some money and, and that was about it. Um, so then I, I went through this phase of probably the next, um, the next six years of trying different jobs and getting quite excited about them at, at certain points, but, but then them not working out. So I did, I did labouring. Um, I went on site and did a labouring for about a year and a half. I did um, some retail store jobs. Uh, did the job at the petrol station. I actually went full time there. Um, did some more bar work as well. Um, tried plastering. So again, back on site again. Um, I actually did sort of later on did some sports franchising. I actually stayed there for quite a long time. That was the job I did um, previous to doing this role. Um, and uh, uh, So that was like small-sided football leagues. Uh, and I used to set them up around the country and um, uh, and then we would sell franchises in them. Um, I did shop fitting, uh, which again is on site. So um, doing petition walls and um, suspended ceilings didn't last very long at that at all. And then picture framing which almost, you know, when I told people I was doing a picture framing apprenticeship, people didn't believe me. My mates were like, what, that's not even a job. What do you mean? Picture frames get made in a factory by a machine. They don't get made by people. Um, and it's the last two there, the shop fitting and the picture framing. That I've, I, I guess I've got two really sort of vivid memories that I guess sort of shaped me um, from both a personality perspective and um, from a work ethic perspective or certainly from understanding what I didn't want to do. Um, I did my first day uh, as a shop fitter um, for a company in Tamworth. And the first job was, I remember uh, I got picked up on the corner of um, where I was living at that point. And uh, at six o'clock in the morning, uh, in a van, four of the lads in there, uh, in one of these trucks, you got a couple of people in the front and then some uh, seats in the back, um, some bigger seats in the back and stuff. And uh, the um, the job was in Coventry. Uh, never met these lads before. Um, I've been on site doing labouring and stuff, so sort of understood understood what the crack was. Um, anyway, we got to Coventry, and um, the first job was we was getting a load of plasterboards off a, um, uh, from a delivery and getting them through this site. Uh, and these lads are um, picking them up and they're picking sort of two to two of these sheets up, two of these uh, plasterboard sheets up, and then I start trying to do two as well, and then they're, then they're doing three, and then I start trying to do three, and eventually I'm just dropping them all over the place. Um, I'm breaking them. Uh, I, I lasted half a day there um, uh, on this site in Cov. And they were absolutely hammering me. I mean, I was like the new kid anyway, from an a, a apprentice perspective. And I just thought, you know what, this isn't for me. But I was so embarrassed that I was going to quit half, halfway into my first day, which to me, you know, I've had a lot of jobs, but one thing I've never re never done is, is like quit them in those circumstances. So instead of um, like finding the gaffer or doing something, you know, probably more responsible and more grown up, I just climbed out of one of the windows on the site and I tried. it was the first floor so i was like hanging from one of these windows and uh, i uh, i i dropped out and then i just walked off and I, so i was in the middle of coventry i mean this guy on screen looks quite um uh quite buoyant and emphatic the way he's left i probably left more like this guy um and i found myself in the middle of coventry and i had to ring my dad and say dad i've, I've quit my job i need you to pick me up and being the good dad that he was, he, he, he did that. And I always look back on that day, very embarrassed, because even when I'm telling the story now, I'm, I'm smiling and I'm laughing, but um, it was a tragic way to um, to try out of a job. And my dad went absolutely, he picked me up, but he went absolutely mad at me. Um, and I, at the time, I remember thinking, yeah, I've rang you because I'm like, you know, I'm the victim here. They were taking the mickey out of me and I, I couldn't do the job properly. And, but actually, in reality, he was completely right. He, 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 in hindsight, he, he was absolutely right. To, he, he gave me a right dressing down um, and basically gave me, read me the right act on, on you know, how I'm meant to be and, you know, um, 
how we're meant to approach work and that you don't quit after half a day. Um, and then the next job I got was, was the picture framing job. Um, and I did that as an apprentice, uh, really long hours, really rubbish pay, but I wanted to sort of try and learn a skill. Um, uh, and I really enjoyed it. I did it with a company that did lots of um, sports memorabilia. So we used to do loads of events. It was it was really interesting. And um, I, got, I learned a lot. And the guy who ran that was a, a chap called Ray, Ray Collister. Um, and he was uh, uh, ex-military, had been in, in the military for like 25 years. Had come out of that and then had set up a business. Um, and as you can imagine, I went from, you know, being the person who quit after half a day to then working for someone who'd been in the military. Um, and it, it changed my perception of, of what, you know, uh, what was expected of me and what good was. Because um, most of the time I, I wasn't good enough for, um, for, the, for what was expected of me um, in a good way though. You know, I was always striving to try and like impress Ray and try and um, get to a point where I'd get some good feedback from him, which he did give me, but only when it was due. And I learned a hell of a lot from him. Um, to the point where I think he, out of everybody who I have worked for, he's probably shaped my work ethic. I used to travel, we would leave at four o'clock in the morning and get back from uh, some of these events at like one o'clock in the morning the next the next night. And um, I'd get paid about 45 quid, 50 quid for, for doing it. And, and he'd give me like two hours off the next morning to come in, you know, it was brutal in the sense of, um, you know, I wasn't really getting much back for it. Um, but one of the uh, one of the things that happened to me when we were at one of the events, and again, it's a vivid one um, uh, for many reasons, but it definitely showed me to be a bit more thicker skinned. I um I was at an event and it was uh, it was down in London, and we used to do these auctions, charity auctions for um, this company. So we were doing one for Chelsea Football Club. So I was so excited about going down there because all the players were going to be there. So. It was down at a racetrack. I think it might have been Ascot or Epsom or, or somewhere like that. I can't remember where. And um, we got there and we were setting up and the players started arriving. I was like beside myself. You know, you've got Frank Lampard there and John Terry and, and Didier Drogba. And, you know, it was it was incredible. And I, I was starstruck. And, um, and then on the night, the, the compare didn't turn up for the auction. So... The person organised me asked Ray to to then compare the night and effectively be the auctioneer or auctioneer, as you, how you would say it, um, which meant then that they'd also um, had a gap and a, a spot where someone needed to basically pick these frames up. Some of these things are really big, so you, you you might have seen them before, but you know football shirts in picture frames or boxing gloves, etc. Some of them are really like big frames, like up to my sort of shoulder. So. I then got landed with the job of doing that. And what you had to do was pick the, pick the frame up and like walk it round the, um, the stage as it was. And then people would bid, uh, you know, I was like a, a really unattractive, um, ring girl, at a boxing match or, you know, uh, and so I'm, I'm going around with this frame on me and then someone just shouts out, look, it's Louis Theroux. And, the um the whole room just started laughing and I'm in the middle of this uh this stage uh trying to carry the weight of this uh this really big picture frame which you know I've got little arms, I'm skinny, skinny um skinny young lad at that point. The whole room is laughing at me and I look over and I've just got this picture of John Terry and Frank Lampard absolutely howling at me. Uh, pointing all the players were and I remember <laughs> I remember it was luckily it was towards the end of the of the auction but I remember walking off and just thinking you if you want to be in any like position where people are going to be sort of like looking at you or um you're going to be on stage or you're going to do any of these things you've just got to get ready for people being able to like hammer you and um and you've got to get thick skin um so I remember, you know, sort of learning from that, that, um, you know, you've got to work hard, but equally you've, um, you've really got to have some thick skin if you want to sort of be in, um, 
in any kind of uh, in any kind of spotlight. I don't know what they were run about anyway. I barely look like him. Um, so at that point, then I'm getting to the the point where I'm outgrowing the picture framing really, and um, I've completed my apprenticeship. I'm running the the gallery as it was then. We had like three or four people working there as well, small team. Um, you know, it's a family run business. So then I'm like. Right, I'm gonna. I've done this now. I'm gonna become a musician. So <laughs> then, then I started gigging, and I was doing like good money from it. But you know, again, it was long hours, and I was a lot of travelling. And um, but I'll, but then I got the, the the taste, I guess, for like running my own business. So I was like, you know, it's good. I, I'm making all my decisions here. I, if I want to travel that far, I can, and if I don't, I won't. You know, sort of like the idea of that. And I've got a bit of a taste of it from from the from the picture framing as well, but it wasn't you know it wasn't the same. It wasn't my business. Um, then I came up with an idea for um, a clothing brand called Geeked. Um, obviously, inspiration taken from my own four eyes. Um, and this was with a friend. We ended up getting the label into about ten stores. We got them onto a few online ones. You know, with this one, I. I I couldn't drive at the time, so I just used to pack bags of T-shirts and hoodies, and I would walk around city centres, Birmingham, Manchester, London, just going into shops with my bag, um, you know, like Del Boy, uh, and I would be trying to sell them. And you know, we got to a certain point, but I was—I had another job at this point. This is when I was um, at the franchising company, and I, you know, in the end, I was like, no, I've—I've I've got family. I've just had a daughter. Um, I thought, no, I've got to concentrate on my job. Um, then I came up with an idea for Tap a Taxi. So this is before, would you believe it, before Uber launched um, in, in the UK, not in America. Um, and, you know, I wanted to create this app that, that you know, people could just get a taxi from uh, from, from an app. And um, Then I, I thought, oh, it's going to cost too much money and, and why people don't want to do it. And so I bounced on that idea. Then I wanted to do one that was around ID. So, you know, whether it's just because I look so young and I've been asked for ID so many times, even when I was old enough. But I thought the idea of carrying identification around with it was sort of a bit archaic, given the um, given the technology. And so this was about seven years ago. Um, but again, you know, I couldn't afford to do it. I had a job. And um I'd really got the taste for basically trying to run my own business. I didn't know what it was going to be. Um, and clearly I had um, a lot of like rubbish ideas that, that either didn't work or I didn't have the stomach for. But what I did know and what I started to get to the point was I was like, I think I'm going to run my own business. I think that's what's going to, that's what I'm going to do. Um, I've tried all these jobs and I'm not that good at all of them. You know, um, how do I get it to a point where I can be running my own business? Um, and then finally, I came up with an idea for um, uh, a business that would teach people to Nordic walk, would you believe? Um, Nordic walking is uh, effectively rambling, but, you know, fitness rambling. And I bought all the gear. I, I don't know whether I was going through like a midlife crisis or what, but... I bought like walking boots, the, the the sticks. I don't even know if they're called sticks, poles, walking poles, walking sticks. I wouldn't have been a very good instructor. I uh, I got the name. It's called Walk the Nordic Way. Um, What's your connection uh, to Nordic walking? Where did that even come from? You know what it was, Joe. I, and I'm embarrassed to say it, but at, it, <laughs> this is this is uh, this is what love does or jealousy. I don't know whether I was having a, a moment. But I'd I'd um I'd met someone who at the time was um uh working with my girlfriend and he said he was doing this and my girlfriend seemed like really like you know um like impressed with him and and I think I just was like I got into it and we became friends and I was like I'm gonna do this and then after <laughs> about a week I, I, of of doing it I was like what I went to London right I went to London went on a two day course to learn how to then teach people to do this and i kid you not we just walked around richmond park with these poles 
um, most of the time people just staring at us being like what what are these losers doing um, this is definitely the worst business idea I've had um, completely unscalable and built around me walking around a, a field um, uh, but you know you live and learn don't you uh, and what I learned was it was a rubbish idea but still even at this point I have adamant that I've got to run my own business I knew then I just knew um, but I then had to move back in with my parents. By this stage, I've moved out, I've got a job, I've got a family. But I end up getting divorced and, um, and I have to move back in with my mum and dad again. And at this point, I am, how old am I? Uh, I'm 28 years old. So it's, yeah, seven years ago, I'm 28 years old. And I, I've, I've flew the nest once already. Twice, really. Yeah, I flew the nest twice and I'm back again. And, you know, this image will come back up again. But it was more like this. I was full ball out of stepbrothers. I was like, I was a, an adult. I was a full-blown adult, you know, and I was back with my mom and dad. And it... Oh, seems as though Lee's connection might have dropped out, but we're back. Lee, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Just said it dropped out. Sorry. Can everyone hear me still? Yeah, yeah, we've got you back. And you can see the big bankrupt sign. We can indeed. <laughs> um, so, yeah, at this point, I'm, I'm, I've got myself into a lot of debt. And I remember um, it was about three to four weeks before we'd started um, on the tools, before we came up with that idea. And... Um, I was having a serious, serious chat with my mum and dad about how I go bankrupt and what that would mean for me and, you know, all these things. But then myself and Adam got drunk on a Friday night. Um, Ad was in the construction industry for 12 years and he was moaning about the fact he couldn't find a plasterer on a job. Now, I'm just a bit of a geek and I, I love technology and always have done. And I was adamant there must be something out there that would allow tradespeople to connect and, and there wasn't really you had things for like trade vetted tradespeople going into your house like checker trade or rated people but there wasn't anything for people on site b2b contractor to subcontractor so we came up with the idea uh for on the tools um sorry my screen seems to have there we go uh, this was our first logo that we came up with, uh, and the idea was to create an app that would allow people to connect with each other, and that was it. We just wanted to start a tech company, basically. Um, we spec'd it out, we sent it to uh, on Elance to a, a, like a freelancing website to go and get built in uh, India, and then we were like, if we can just create a Facebook page or a following that will allow us to get 100,000 builders in one spot, then we'll build the app, we'll launch it, and we'll be rich like that was the business model um and we went through these logos and we we settled on um we settled on this one um and then this has become this and and actually what on the tools ended up becoming was just the biggest community for construction uh, and for tradespeople in the world um uh it's predominantly built out of the uk we now have three and a half million followers um 80% of, of those are in the trade. Uh, obviously, given the industry, it's, it's, uh, it's a big male skew in terms of our following. And we didn't even launch the app. We got ripped off with the app. Uh, after a year, it didn't, we got the app back. It didn't even work. We had to then build again in the UK. Um, we had months where we couldn't pay ourselves. And we used to share a car. We, we shared a car. We used to like almost have custody of it. One of us would have it one weekend. The other one would have it the other. Um, we shared a bag that we used to sh like take to different meetings, you know. Um, and then eventually we realized that the app wasn't going to launch, but we built this community that we could start working with brands and creating content. And we became this, this, uh, this publishing brand, you know, by pure accident. And then we sort of roll forward four years from there and we, we acquired another community called On a Budget, 
um, which is the opposite of on the tools. That is um, 3 million women in the UK that like to share ideas and save money uh, in the home across things like gardening, DIY, cooking, um, crafts. Uh, and then, then we had just an identity crisis, really. We didn't really know what, um, what or who we were again. Um, so we formed Electric House. And Electric House was actually the name of our first office building that we got. Uh, it was awful. Um, it, was, it was about as big as the room I'm in now, and it had prison bars on the window. Um, but we just loved the name and loved the fact it was linked to the sort of the story, I guess. So we now, we, we now create content for brands uh, we produce it and we distribute it um, and we do that for the likes of Fiat, McDonald's, Holland and Barrett, Lidl, um, Direct Line, Bosch, you know, some some huge, huge brands um, and I get to do it with my best mate um, and you'll see there on the left, you've got Mark who's on the left there, Ian who's his brother, I'm in the middle, you wouldn't recognise me, um, Adam, uh, to the right, and then Andy on the furthest right. We all known each other for about well. I've known Adam since I was ten years old. Um, I've known Mark since the same as well. We've I used to work with Andy at um, this franchising company, so collectively we've known each other for about fifteen years, and um, we now get to work with each other every day. And we've built a team of sixty-two people. We've just moved into new offices in, um, uh, in February, which obviously because of uh, the current situation we've had to close uh, at the moment, so everyone's working from home. But I've gone from navigating my way of really not knowing what I wanted to do um, to then becoming more fulfilled than, than I ever thought I could be. Um, I wake up every morning um, knowing that I get to do something that just excites the life out of me, and I, I feel really lucky about that. Um, but I do think there's something in not knowing um and i think there's a, there's a couple of things that i would sort of have as like as, as like takeaways i guess if, if i was going to sort of try and round it up and i think life is about not knowing and, and the finding out is the best part and i think that's easy for me to say that now that i'm in a position where i'm, I'm happy and i've got a job and I've... oh it seems as though we can still see you but your screens your screen just stopped sharing that's all oh okay hang on one second <laughs> It's saying it's still, bear with me. Sorry, guys. You get to see it's me. Right. Right. Technology for you. Oh, no. Um, um, just while that's uh, coming back up again, still can't see it. Uh, it's loading. Just while that's coming back up, uh, it's everyone who's watching, make sure you uh, upvote those questions that you like the look of, and uh, we'll get those uh, answered for you um, during the session. Here we go. Uh, life's about not knowing, finding out is the best part. There we go. Um, but I, I really do believe that. And I think, you know, if anything, hopefully this sort of story um, shows is that it's okay not to know what you want to do when you're at school or when you're in sixth form, even when you're at university still. Um, lots of people are lucky enough to go to university knowing exactly what they want to do. So they might be, you know, training to be a doctor or... Um, a nurse or an architect or something that, that needs that qualification. Loads of people at university who, who go there like I, I did and do courses that then they don't go on to use or that they do go on to use. But I guarantee 80% of the people there still don't know what they're actually going to do. Um, and that's at university, let alone knowing when you, I don't know, if you do any GCSEs. Um, I think it's about trying different things. Uh, I think the second thing is, um, is it's got to excite you, you know, if, if it doesn't excite you, then then don't do it. And if it does, it, it's, it's probably something you should do. Um, because for me, I've tried so many different jobs now. Um, and the ones that you're lasting are the ones that when you wake up, you don't have that feeling. And, and you know, a lot of you weren't as experienced this year, I guess. But... I've had jobs where on the Sunday night, even the Sunday afternoon, I'm getting this like feeling in my stomach where I'm like, oh man, I've got work tomorrow. I don't, I don't want to go, you know. And then you wake up Monday morning, and that dread feels even worse. 
And that's no way to do life. That's no way to do your career. It's about doing something that genuinely excites you. And I, I, I honestly believe this. If it doesn't, you should change it. Um, and then the third thing is it's never too late to change paths. And I think I'm an, uh, you know, a definite example of that. I've lived like two lives, I feel like. Um, and I'm, I'm only 35, which I'm sure to some of you, unfortunately, um, feels really old and quite far away, which, you know, fair play to you. But, um, I still feel very young and, um, you know, I've not even got to the halfway point of my life. And, uh, I changed past five years ago, you know, um, at 30 years old, I started this business and, it's a big jump. Don't get me wrong. I was, I risked everything I had, but at the time it felt like a good gamble because I was like, well, it's either bankruptcy or this will get me out of it. You know, I was in a sort of, uh, um, uh, do it or don't do it type of affair. And, um, but I, I really do believe that if, um, it, it's never too late, you know, you could be 40 years old and still change, uh, career path. So you can try something in your twenties and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you change it. It doesn't matter if you spent four or five years at university doing something, but then you go, actually, I can't see myself doing this for the rest of my life. It doesn't excite me. Then change it. You absolutely can. Um, and I think that's, you know, they're my sort of three takeaways from my, um, uh, my life story, if you will. Um, and from my, from my, uh, ping, ping pong, um, uh, career path uh, and that's me I hope that was um, a lot. I don't know how long I've been talking for Joe sorry um, you've been going for exactly 40 minutes so oh. bang on Lee thank you so much for that um, it was fantastic and I think you know you're absolutely right that the main message I think one of the main messages to take away is the fact that it's, it is never too late and we've done loads of these sessions before where you know people are talking about um, uh, apprenticeships and university options it's never too late to go to university and it's never too late to do an apprenticeship because apprenticeships you know they're minimum age of 16 and we've we've spoken to people before who've done apprenticeships at the age of 35 um, and yeah. people from university at the age of 60 you know you can go whenever you want and um i think it's important that i i, I don't know about you but i've spoken to a few adults who turn around and say oh i did um oh, I, I did uh history in, as my degree and now I'm a nurse you know yeah. there'll be so many it, you don't have to stick to that degree that you did 100 percent, 100 percent, and I think that's and that's all the reason to go to university and do those and, and take that time to do that and it's all the reason not to you know it, it, there's no right or wrong with it for me if you want to go and do history at university and mm. but you're not really sure whether it's going to be the right career path or not but you love it go and do it like go do it go live the uni life go Go educate yourself. Go meet new people. You meet amazing people when you when you go and do any of these things. Um, not everything should be bound by oh, if this doesn't lead to this, if I don't have the answer to this, it's not about that. You know, um, it, you've got to sort of live to a certain extent in the now. Planning's fine, and I'm all for it. Um, but you can't have the answers to everything. You can't know everything. Absolutely, absolutely. Right. Let's crack on with some of these questions. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left for a uh, Q&A. Um, guest 234 has asked, what's it like to go, this, I actually wrote this question down at the start as well, so uh, what's it like to go into business with your mates? We're often told that it's not a good idea. I, I went into business with my best friend and we're no longer friends. Take Facebook, <laughs> for example, you know, they're no longer friends and that didn't exactly end well. So how does it work out for you and not us? You know what, you know what? it was the one thing that we got told so many times by so many people, even people who, so bear in mind as well at the start of this, there's, we actually started on the tools with the five of us officially. So me and Ad came up with the idea in, in August 2014. And then then we looped Mark in. And then we got Mark's brother in Ian. And then we got Andy in. There's five of us. When we incorporated the company in November, there was five people, five, effectively five founders, right? And then after about a year, we were getting people who were like, oh, we want to invest. We want to give you 50 grand or whatever it might be. And we were like, for for fifty percent or for forty percent, and we were like, no, we, there won't be enough left for us, you know. There's no point. And they were like, well, we'll buy these two people out, and we were like, no. And I, well, you shouldn't be in business. I'm telling you now, you, you're in business with your mates. It isn't going to work out for you. I think the difference is, is from, and we've had a chat about this a lot. 
um, between us all and, and we've been questioned on it before. But everyone knows the role, right? There's no power struggle. Um, I ended up being the CEO because I was the first one to quit my job and jump onto the business. So I got the role from just being risky, you know, yeah. um, and and then it's led from there. And I think there's net like Ad and Andy and Mark, there's never a power struggle. Everyone knows who reports into who and everyone knows what they're good at and everyone knows what they're bad at. You know, Ad is super creative. He was born to be that creative director. Um, I'm not as creative as him. Um, Ad's a much better people manager than I am. I can manage a few people and I'm good. If it's math, I'll start like losing. Um, I start losing control of things and I can't, you know, um, I'm not very good at, I'm definitely not a micromanager. I, I like people to just get on with their stuff. And so I like the idea of having more um, senior members of staff reporting to me that I can trust and, you know, that are basically that are better than me. Um, because I'm not that good at anything. I've, as you can see from the story, I'm a bit of, I'm trying just to, I'm a jack of all trades. So I think going into business with your friends, obviously there's always a risk of, of you know, falling out because people fall out of the money, what it ends up being, you know. But we've always been really clear that we're all or nothing together and um, everyone knows what they're doing. And yeah, I think we just love each other too much to, to let it happen. But um you know, and, and we're, we're too far in now. It's five years. It ain't going to happen now. If it was going to happen, it would have happened like a couple of years ago, wouldn't it? And as well, um, just before we get another question, you know, you've got friends in a business as well as family. You know, that they are like the two most important things. You know, that yeah. Really so yeah, we, quite the dynamic. We had, yeah, we had Adam's wife and my mum as our first employees. Yeah, uh, my mom's retired now, but she, yeah, um, but she was the driving force of the business at one point, do you know what I mean? And, and, and you just, I'm not going to, don't get you wrong, like family, family's harder than friends. Ooh, loads harder, but it, it, it never caused massive problems. It just didn't, um, so it can be done, is my point. Yeah. It can be done. It can be done. Uh, guest 679 has asked, do you think that all those jobs you did, even if it was for a short while, Helped you get some experience or learn something that you would go on to use later on? Um, yeah, definitely. Well, like I said, from those, you know, those sort of two stories and that, you know, um, I think you learn, you learn something from every job you do because, and especially when you're doing different jobs like that, each job I was doing was like a different industry or certainly a different sector within an industry. Um, and, I think the time that you do them, so the length of time, but the age you do them at, you take different things away from them. Um, and you learn and understand more about yourself. I think that was the key bits I learned. I was like, oh, that's not for me, or this is for me, actually. I quite like it. But after time, maybe it's not. It's not something I can see myself doing for 10 years or 20 years. Or, um, but I, I, I sort of feel like I'm I'm going to be a decade changer. I think every decade I'm going to just change what I do. I don't know uh, whether that's just the way I roll. Um, but I think change is good sometimes. I quite like it. Um, uh, but yeah, I think you definitely learn different different bits um, from from different roles. And I think it's worth for everyone who's watching. You know, change. Some people really thrive off change. They really enjoy it. You know, change things lots and lots, but it's absolutely okay if you're not. Like, if you really love what you do and you want to stay doing that for the rest of your life. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, a hundred percent. Um, yeah, I, I just it, it's to me change is something that I like because I get bored easily. But equally, you know, I haven't changed anything for for a long time now, for five years, and I've been more happy than I've ever been. So, you know, there, there's there's something to be said about you know not uh not having too much change as well nice uh we've got time for two more questions um so we'll take the question from guest 971 and uh we'll see which next question gets upvoted to be the last question that we asked today uh guest 971 has asked while doing all of those different part-time jobs do you ever look back at your decision to leave uni and say you know what that was a mistake no no i don't and not not because I would love to have a degree, right? But not because I've got a degree, but just because I've completed something, you know. Yeah. So I think that the only bit I regret in that sense is that I never did very well at completing things in academically. I, it, it's like um, <laughs> this is silly, but like I don't, 
I'm not the greatest re reader. Like I, I tend to do Audible a lot um, if I'm going to consume books. So when I read a book now, if I read one, when I get to the end of it, it's like um, I feel so <laughs> I feel so proud of myself that I've finished an actual book that I've read. Right. So I sort of like I would put it akin to that where. I feel like the only thing I regret about not doing university is just completing it and just having the, the, the feeling of doing it. But if I think about it in terms of like my career or was it for me and those types of things, it just wasn't for me. I know it wasn't, the lifestyle was, but the actual um, university part, you know, which is pretty key and important, um, it just wasn't, no. So I, I don't have a regret from that. Isn't it? Um, That's the part of knowing that you've, you know, done the long haul and, and that sort of thing yeah um right let's uh da, 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 let's take uh i think guest 845 has something to say yeah lee your determination to keep going and trying new things is both inspiring and a bit scary if i'm honest but clearly you've always been full of ideas and had the entrepreneurial spirit uh thank you to that guest for saying that oh, uh guest 303 had <laughs> guest 303 has asked uh, with no formal qualifications and bouncing off of different roles uh, did you ever think you'd be working with brands like those <laughs> not a chance I, I never thought you know it, it wasn't really until I was like 26 27 that I started thinking I've got to run my own business you know mm -hmm. um uh, and then I, then I failed at running loads of like trying to start businesses so it, it there wouldn't be a, you know, if you could go back and ask the 20, even the 29 year old me, are you really going to be able to run a business? I've probably been like, nah, I'd, I'd like to, but I don't know whether I've, I've got it in me. You know, now, now we've got a business that's got 62 people in it. And by the end of next year, we'll have a hundred, you know, and, and, and you can't, um, I feel hugely grateful that people even want to work for a company that I've run, you know, I mean, who would do that? It doesn't, that, that, when I sit and think about that, I don't, that doesn't, it doesn't make sense. So now, you know, I, I love the fact that we've been able to work with big brands and, and, and it's exciting, you know, it's, it's, you get a big, you get a brief from a brand like McDonald's and you're like, oh, no way, it's like McDonald's, you know. Um, it is exciting, but we, and the, and the best thing about that is that we get to, you know, I get to do it with my mates. Um, yeah. You know, it's a, it's a good feeling. So, uh, but no, I totally wouldn't have thought I'd been able to do it. But I think that just proves the fact that you can do anything. Like, I, you know, on paper and by rights, I shouldn't be running my own company. That that's that's fair. Like, and and and, but I am. So I'm like, you know, and I'm not an anomaly. There's loads of people like me. I've met them. Like, actually, the people who run businesses tend to be a bit like me. You know, like, oh, I didn't know what I was doing, and you know, this sort of happened. Um, so I'm not an anomaly. I'm not like a one-off. I'm not special. <laughs> Lee, thank you so much for chatting with us this afternoon. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, and uh, thank you so much once again for being here and for answering everyone's uh, questions today. Just one thing I was just going to say, if anyone's got any questions after this or anything, just add me on LinkedIn and message me and I'll uh, happily reply um, wherever I can. Fantastic. And we'll, if it's okay with you, we'll we'll get some of these questions that we haven't been able to answer over to you. Um, and if you wouldn't mind just doing a, a couple of few replies, we'll put them on the replay yeah. of this webinar. Um, so check back uh, in a couple of days time. Lee, once again, thank you ever so much. Thank you. Uh, right, the Children's Trust is uh, the UK's leading charity for children with brain injury. If you consider donating, please do so via the link that's on screen now. It's the childrenstrust.org.uk forward slash donate we'll be back tomorrow afternoon for another live careers talk this time with natasha cadle creative director and co-founder of envy which is an award-winning full-service post-production company that has worked on uh, projects like top gear the great british bake-off the voice uk and many many more i'm definitely going to be watching that one myself uh take care everyone enjoy the rest of your day bye-bye cheers guys